Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Live here on Keystroke Medium. I am Josh Hayes here with Scott Moon and William Allen Webb. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of stuff today, specifically the Hit World universe, uh, a new, brand new universe coming from uh, Chris Kennedy and his publishing company. They've actually created their whole a whole brand new imprint for this thing. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little later. Uh, first, welcome to everybody in the live chat. Uh, if you're here and you're watching, hello, Rick Partlow is the first comment of today. He gets the golf clap of appreciation from Keystroke Medium. Who else is here? Let's see. I know it's kind of early. I know Rick was first, but I'm pretty sure he somehow cheated by coming first. He cheated because he said, yeah, that's, that's like, what's the link for the YouTubes? <laughs> uh, Corey is here. Uh, Patricia is here. Lauren, hello. Uh, good morning. If you haven't started your morning out with keystroke coffee you're really not doing yourself any favors this coffee is fantastic this is my favorite blend i'm drinking it right now we have whole bean check this out we have whole bean coffee click that right you can find that on our website you scroll down here you can find it on our website you click where's my favorite where is it right here over here writer's block get give me the there we go bam whole bean right there I'm pretty sure if you don't drink Keystroke Medium Coffee, you'll probably die. <laughs> I'm not trying to scare anybody. He's not a medical doctor or anything. <laughs> That's probably true. Uh, let's see. What else we have going on? Oh, yeah, guys, 100%. I'm going to put this link in the channel. I know I posted it on the group last night. You need to go to this YouTube channel by Jeff Haskell. Click that link. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell. Jeff Haskell is going to be doing 24 hours uh, of writing to write a novel. Uh, he's going to try to write a, a complete novel in 24 hours. He's going to be like secluded in some like hidden uh, hotel room somewhere, uh, pumping out the words. We're giving giving him some free coffee for his efforts. Say he better have some free coffee. <laughs> That's crazy. I, you know what I've. You know, I've considered doing some some streaming while I write and whatever, and I'm like, man, like I could I could, I could probably do three or four hours, not not twenty four hours. Oh, man, I that's crazy to me. I don't I don't even know what to say to that. But Jeff, you're a monster. Uh, I know you're gonna do really well. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's the a couple of announcements that I had right at the beginning of the show. Uh, let's jump right into what we've been doing this week in our writing lives. And Scott, I'm going to put you on the uh, hot seat first. Oh, good. I actually have something to say. I'm looking at the live chat. Silent Wolf says hi to uh, William. Says glad to see you on the podcast. Uh, everybody's in there. Yep, it's a good deal. So what I did this week, mostly a uh, big surprise. Did a lot of writing. Um, <clears throat> I finished Orphan Wars and sent that off to the publishing team over at Variant. And I'm working on finishing... Uh, departure day, which I was struggling with. Um, but this morning, I really got yeah, last night this morning is doing well. So I'm very excited about that. Um, just a lot of good things trying to stay positive, trying to stay off social media as much as I can and bite my tongue. So that's all <laughs> I to say about that. But um, yeah, no, it's good. Uh, I have we had a birthday in the house yesterday. So my my youngest daughter got a whole bunch of presents, and we had cake, and I ate lots of cake last night. So that's that's obviously pretty nice. I don't know that you could ever go wrong with cake. Yeah, yeah. I I, I saved up for it all day, and then I just destroyed it. It was very. You, the, you know, you had the paper bowl, and you put the cake in the paper bowl, and then you put milk in it. Mm -hmm. You can do that. It's not wrong in our house. I mean, <laughs> way. it's we call it cake cereal. It's fine. <laughs> or you can put what I like to do instead of using milk is I'll use ice cream and then eat it in such a violent frenzy that it kind of gets liquefied into a milk-like substance that you can eat your cake in. It's also good as well. But yeah, no, I'm good. What are you guys up to? Uh, Bill, why don't you go ahead, man? I'll go last this today. I, I did want to comment. You said there's no, you know, cake can't ever be bad. If eggplant was one of the ingredients, I think it could be. Well, but, yeah, that's true. I forgot about the mysterious eggplant eggplant cake is yeah fairly disgusting what if it's a cake shaped like an eggplant well that'd be all right i think we could shape that. it like anything um yeah. but uh yeah uh, we're gonna anyway. make a cake and shape it like josh's face and then we're all gonna eat it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i was trying okay. to get his coffee out anyway moving yeah. on from that extremely strange diatribe uh, um for, for me i'm just i'm like 
probably every other writer in the world. And, uh, you know, I just been up writing every day and trying to get things going, uh, finishing up a story for, uh, you guys may know Charles, Chuck Gannon, Charles E. Gannon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, he has a um, – last year he came out with a series called Murphy's Lawless that Chris published, mm -hmm. Chris Kennedy. Yep. And uh, there were six novellas, and then they were tied together as a novel. And I was asked to do one of the novellas for this year's series. And so I'm finishing that up and uh, just actually wrote the first sentence for the sequel to the book we came on to discuss today right. about an hour ago. So oh. – but we were talking before the show, Josh, about how writers have so many ideas and things. Yep. And I don't know how you guys work, but I've generally got six to 10 projects open on my desk at any one time. <laughs> yeah. Scott's more of a multitasker than I am, but uh, I, yeah. I think I have like, I, th I, have th I have three. I think three is my limit. Let me show you my spreadsheet. Yes, I want to see it. No. <laughs> I don't know if I can share on this. Well, I'd have to. I'm on my PC here, then my Mac's over there, and I'm all confused. But yeah, my spreadsheet's retarded. I make a new one every year. Well, last year I made 73 spreadsheets to track my pro progress, but I'm sticking to one this year. 73 spreadsheets? Because mm -hmm. I'll make a new one. I'll be like, oh, this would be better if I did it this way. And so okay. I went to look at the tabs to clean out last year's spreadsheet and make my new one. And it just kept going and going. All the versions that I had made of it, there's at least 73 different versions of that spreadsheet. So I need to stop. It's really a sickness. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm a I'm a pantser, so yeah, I completely well, I, agree. I, writing, I'm I'm more of a pantser than a plotter, but I do I like to do what Chuck Chuck mainly always says about being a a pantser with a plan. But when it comes to tracking my daily pro productivity, is where I get into spreadsheet hell. You know, that's, that's really interesting, Scott, because I'm exactly the same way. Um, I have a plan for the books or stories or whatever they are, and I write until I run out of those ideas uh -huh. and, and then just kind of pick it up and, and go with wherever it goes. But I have spreadsheets to track everything I've done. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so it's that weird dichotomy of super organized in one area of your life or brain mm -hmm. and then complete disorganization yeah. in another. I like the productivity tracking because if I have bad days, I can look at that and go, see, I did do something. I may feel like I'm not making any progress, but something happened there. Right. Yeah. And we'll, hopefully it'll be worth something someday. Yeah. Well, I get it. Speaking of spreadsheets, the Keystro Rimo 2021 spreadsheet is available now. If you want to get on the group's uh, efforts to track our words through 2020 accountability or accountability group. I think yeah. T.S. Hoddle is like smashing it. This, this month. is he? I haven't looked at it this week. Yeah. He's got 30,975 so far this month. Boom. Whoa. That first place. And uh, actually total for, we almost have a million words total for the accountability spreadsheet this month. And it's only the 11th. Yeah. Wow. So there's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of people on there. So it, it adds up. It's it takes a village. For sure. That's, That's impressive. impressive. Well, considering I think that a couple, like what last year, what was our total last year? I forget, but it was. Well, our total last year was six or 7 million words, but not everybody tracked the words very, yeah. very consistently. So that was like eight people. Right. You know, did all the, or maybe less. Cause actually probably, well, cause, cause Rick Partlow was 1 million of those 8 million words. <laughs> and true. was another million and a half. That's true. Yes, I don't see them. And then so Tom. But. Well, that's my goal for this year. It was for last year. It was a million. I didn't make it. But uh, how close did we get? Uh, I think I probably got up to six seventy five, seven hundred thousand somewhere solid. there. Yeah, that's and, solid work. Um, this year I'm I'm a little behind. Uh, just stuff happens. You guys know. Yeah. Right. Uh, but but I'm hanging in there fairly close. Well, it depends because sometimes you do a lot more editing and revision or you're doing more collaboration and editing or something. And so the raw word, I, I, that's why I track time and word count. And so yes. just so that if I get too discouraged about my word count, I can still go, look, I did five hours yesterday on top of my day job. So I did put some work in. And, and, and I kind of do it similar in that uh, if I'm going to do co-writing, especially I do co-writing at two to one. So if I'm co-writing something and, um, I go over 5,000 words and, and revise them and do that kind of stuff. Then I'll count that as 2,500 for me because wow. I'm reading, I'm reading every word yep. and deciding whether it's the right word for this situation. Right. Yep. Uh, I may not change it, 
but that doesn't mean I, I didn't put the work in to look at it and say, okay, that's the yeah. way it should be said and that kind of thing. Well, and that's, that is required work to get something finished. So it's not like I screwed off on social media. I mean, you, you are doing work that has to be done when you do those types of deep revisions and edits and, and things. So it's very important not to yeah. lose track of that. Very valuable. Um, there's, I, I've got a book uh, waiting for me right now. It's finished by a young lady that I'm co-writing it with first in a new series. And, um, uh, it will probably, I probably won't add much to 3000 words tops, but I will read the whole 90,000 word book and edit it and, you know, um, make sure that it keeps her voice, but also everything's smooth in the way I would like it to be. To yeah. sound. It fits your current fan base and whatnot. Exactly. Yep. I, uh, I actually have, uh, not doing, and I spent almost four months doing a, uh, edit on Blood and Steel, the first tranquility book I'm writing with Devin C. Ford. So this last week has been almost all brand new words for me and uh, in a short story with uh, Casey Azell. Oh, nice. Um, we're, we're writing um, two, uh, they're not really mirrored stories, but they're conjoined stories in his, in uh, Jamie Ibsen's We Dare Three. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. And uh, we're bringing back two characters that we uh, created for his first We Dare anthology and uh, had a really good story meeting last week and pounded out a whole bunch of words. I'm working on the, the final chapter uh, today. And of course, yesterday I wrote words and didn't track them down. So I have absolutely no idea how many words I wrote yesterday. Uh, and um, I've got to go back and like guesstimate. Like, I think yeah. this is where I started writing it. And uh, yeah, that's and good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I do get that. And Casey, Casey's awesome. Um, oh, yeah, for sure. And, and just a unique viewpoint, but just so good at what she does. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I, I had a – she presented the first, like, the base idea. And then um, uh, over a couple of days, I kind of played that around in my head and came up with what I thought may be a good kind of uh, narrative flow to the story and how to bring it out. Mm -hmm. And I had written – I think I probably wrote about 5,000 words before we had our story meeting. And so like the whole time I'm like, please like it, please like it, please like it, please like it. And, uh, it's no she, Throw more no pressure. Pressure. Crap. and, uh, and she came up with some really cool, um, twists on the story that really, I didn't have to change very much at all in my story. I had to go back and change, like tweak a couple things, but I didn't sure. have to go back and really do any rewriting. And uh, what she came up with was just awesome. And uh, so I'm really excited. Probably have it done today and tomorrow. And then I'll send it off to her so she can read it. And then uh, I'm, I might wait until like the 31st to give it to Jamie. Just because. Because uh, <laughs> like the first the first uh, anthology that we wrote, we were literally writing at 1130 p.m. the night of the deadline. Oh, I've done that. And, and uh, so it's kind of a running joke now. And I wish Chris was here because um, I am historically known for going over. Did you also go over? Word counts. I'm over right now. Look, I'm just going to say I'm over right now. It's probably going to be under by the time I go back and do the cuts. Uh, but I'm over by like 300 now, and I haven't finished the chapter. Oh, that's, that's, Sorry, minor. that's my bad. Yeah, and Chris is such a slave driver about that he stuff. Really, he really is. I know. Yeah. He's not here, so we can talk about it. Man. Yeah. yeah. Stupid Chris. Gosh, I, mean, no, I didn't say that now, but <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. I remember when we we were in the anthology. Uh, which one was it? Was I have it up here? Um, Hope uh, a few credits more. more. Yeah, because yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. And, great, yeah. great book, great book. Josh yeah. and everybody turned in these uh, stories that went over, and I'm watching the banter, and I'm going, "He must," because mine was way longer than that. Even mine was like like probably. 30% longer than the deadline than, than, than the limit. And, and I kept my mouth shut and then all of a sudden he figured it out. And then of course my best to be <laughs> Scott's, Scott's like the guy, like I'm the dude that's like, man, I blew it by 5,000 words, dude. Sorry. And Chris, uh, Scott's just like, that's like okay. sliding under the radar. <laughs> It'll until. be okay. Yeah. Um, ask forgiveness, not permission. Right. Oh, yeah. Exactly. 100%. Yeah, I, I did that with um, the uh, Peacemaker anthology uh, with Kevin Eikenberry, mm -hmm. and I saw him at Superstars, and I was finishing up the story, and, and I said, uh, you know, uh, Kevin, you said 9,000. Um, could it be a little over? 
Well, I don't know how much is a little, I don't know, a couple thousand words. <laughs> well, no, probably not. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think for the first, for a few credits more, I think me and Mark Wandry were up at like 12, 13,000 words for yeah. the thousand word story. And, and, and Mark never goes long. Mm -mm. No. <laughs> no. It's historically accurate. Oh yeah, right. Kevin Eikenberry says over by three hundred laughs in three thousand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Those the, those the writing in that universe is so much fun. You almost don't want to stop. That's the problem. I mean, you could you probably just keep on going. Yeah, so. it, it really is true. Yeah, and the great thing I like about writing in in the Four Horsemen universe specifically is, um, I mean, there's a little bit of canon that is. Uh, you can't mess with Not negotiable, uh, but for the most part, you could pretty much do whatever you want and he'll make it fit. Uh, and I, I really enjoy that because, you know, I, I haven't, I've read a couple of the books, but I, I don't know the series canon. I, I'm not, right. I haven't read all the books. So when I go to write a short story, I'm like, is this going to work? And then, you know, he's got a pretty significant world Bible too. So it's well, to and all the books, yeah. Um, I, and I cheated, you know, uh, the novel I did last year, High Mountain Hunters in, in the 4HU, I cheated because I just used uh, Gurkhas, which have never really been explored. And so I said, uh, and I said it in Nepal. Well, you need to read the book. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I said it in Nepal and put them on a, a different planet. And, uh, you know, a couple, of, a couple of alien races, yeah. one that's intelligent, but not mercenary or anything. And so I just kind of moved the whole thing elsewhere. And and only dealt with a little bit of the actual 4HU canon, uh, Caspers and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I kind of viewed it as cheating a little bit, but but it worked. I cheated because both of my stories don't have anything to do with the Mercs or the the uh, Caspers or anything. They all deal with. Um, like the first one was a guy that was trying to be a peacemaker, and then he decided he didn't want to be a peacemaker. I remember that. And what, and I can't remember who it was. I think it was, was it Eikenberry? I can't remember who stole the name of my short story, but yeah. some, cause it was originally peacemaker. And then somebody wrote the novel peacemaker and, and Chris was like, ah, you can't have that title. Yeah. Whatever. That's Kevin. That's yeah. Kevin. Yeah. Thanks. Bastards. <laughs> and since he's listening, you know, you can. Yeah. Right. Thanks Kevin. <laughs> me uh face got that yes <laughs> well let's talk about your books uh so you sure. you're in the four horsemen universe uh your series the last brigade has gotten some really good reviews on amazon a lot of reader uh ship in that universe uh let's talk about your beginnings uh where did you start out and and kind of where have you gone from there um i am the proverbial 50 year overnight success <laughs> in that uh yeah i've been writing since i was probably and, and writing being a loose term here, you know, when we're all kids, we're trying to, we just imitate what other people have done and, and try and make it a little bit our own. Uh, but I've been doing it since I was probably 13, which would be 52 years now. Wow. It, like and um, I grew up, uh, in fact, in college, one of the reasons it took me 38 years to graduate is that um, my first go around, I was reading a book to two books every day. And, um, it was all the same stuff. Howard, Robert E. Howard, uh, Roger Zelazny, Robert Heinlein, all the classics, Fritz Leiber, Fritz Leiber, for those who don't know, wrote a series called Fafford and the Gray Mouser. And he, he is one of the most influential uh, authors on me, the way he told a story. Hmm. What was his name again? Fritz Leiber, L E I B E R. And he wrote about um, uh, his two main characters were Fafford and the Gray Mouser. Fafford's a seven foot redhead giant. The Gray Mouser's five feet tall. He's a thief. This is back in the 40s. Right after Howard died, he kind of came along. But it's a totally different style. It's a very, very literary style. And he did a lot of firsts. Um, uh, if you go back and you actually read about it, he's one of those people you've never heard of whose influence on today's publishing industry is remains tremendous yeah I'm but but you right now yeah nobody knows it and um a specter's hauling texas was a phenomenal book uh really really good stuff and he was a very literate writer so anyway when i got to college uh i wanted to be uh, after um i think 
creative writing was my fifth or sixth major. Uh, I, I was thinking, golly, okay, botany. I mean, uh, forestry doesn't work because you got to take botany, and that's too hard. So what can I do now? Uh, you know, what what courses can I take that are really easy that'll allow me to stay out until two a.m. and you know, I don't have to go to class. Um, and uh, it turned out to be creative writing. Um, the problem with that was that. Have either of you guys ever taken a college creative writing course? Oh, yeah. Good times. I don't know about your experience. Mine was they're not trying to teach you how to write. They're trying to teach you what to write. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, they just want you, to, they want you to read classics. And any story you write, they don't really understand it because they don't understand the genre at all. And so they're trying to take your sci-fi story and make it into like um, a literary um uh, coming of age story. I'm like, it's, you know, it's, so yeah. it can be frustrating if you don't realize that's the game when you go into this class, they can be good. I think, but you got to understand they're talking about a different type of writing. And, and, and you and I obviously had the same teachers. Yeah, <laughs> probably almost exactly. Yeah. So uh, mine, however, weren't so nice. One of them told me if you turn in, um, if you turn in a genre story, uh, it's an F. Yeah. I want, yeah. You know, and uh, they didn't care anything about plot. They didn't care anything about endings. They just wanted characterization. William Tyler Davis in the chat says he had exactly the same experience. The proof, the professor didn't allow fantasy. Yep. Yep. Didn't, didn't consider it writing. Yep. And uh, it, it's interesting that the, I went to the University of Memphis and some of the uh, people, uh, those teachers are all gone, but the current ones who are maintaining the same thing, if you actually look at their reviews, the reviews are terrible. And, you know, they've got like four reviews and they're right. They're in charge of the creative writing program. Right. And so you, you're thinking, OK, I'm doing because I, I'm teaching because I couldn't do. Anyway, I'm sure they're wonderful. And, and looking back on it, I actually learned quite a bit, as I'm sure you did. Oh, yeah. It's just we also had to forget a whole bunch of stuff to actually write things people wanted to hear. Yeah, you just have to be able to take what you need from it. And, you know, like I'm all, I'm all about trying something new. Like my wife made me try Pilates the other day and I went and tried it. It's not normally my thing, but I'll try it. And maybe something I'll bring something. Same thing with, with the, with those creative writing courses, there is good stuff in there. And if nothing yep. else, it puts you under pressure and mm -hmm. it, it toughens you up because you have to go in there every time facing your class and facing this teacher, you know, is going to be super critical. And that's not a bad thing. You know, it's, it toughens you up a little bit. It does, and you've just got to learn that just because somebody has a particular criticism doesn't mean it's right. Exactly. So you have to learn to judge it. Yeah, and so it is a crucible in which you can learn uh, quite a bit. And, and yeah. I did. I just didn't realize it at the time. And yeah. so I wrote a whole bunch of stuff. I, I basically quit writing fiction in 1996 because I was just tired of rejections. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I, And I'm to blame. I'm going to take the, the uh, hit on this. I put Twilight Zone magazine out of business. <laughs> uh, in 1996, I sold my very first ever story to Twilight Zone magazine. And three weeks after they sent me the acceptance letter, they sent me another one. I thought it was the contract. Dear Mr. Webb, we're very sorry. We're suspending publication. <laughs> it's not you. It's us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 23, 23 years of submitting. I finally sell something. Yeah. So, uh, I suspended everything because I was just, you know, after that much and I had a family and time and all that. And I was just, okay, that's it. I, I've given it all my best shot. I can't do it. Yeah. And, and uh, I turned to writing uh, nonfiction. I'm a military historian. And so, um, which I just, I love, I absolutely love World War II and writing about it. Um, I have a 300,000 page book out on on the end of the war in Austria, which is the definitive war history of it. So, um, I'm pardon me. What's that? What's that called? I saw that uh, on your, on your, yeah. Killing yeah. Hitler's Reich. The battle for Austria, 1945, um, took me 13 years to write it. Uh, it, I loved every minute of it because I, I'm translating these arcane German, anecdotes there are no records left from that end of the war so most of it's anecdotal or personal histories and most of it's in german uh i wrote the book because there's virtually nothing about it in english yeah 
And so I was, I was, I loved that. And in 2014, uh, September 1st, 2014, I, and and Josh, you asked me about my history, so you're getting it. Hey, Um, reach on brother. I love it. I, I had, I don't know how you guys, the story ideas come to you. They come to me as these little, um, movies or vignettes that play out in my mind. Mm. And I don't know what they go to. They're just like disconnected scenes. Yeah. And I had two that had been running through my mind for a long time. One was of a man standing on a castle in uh, Salzburg, Austria, on the Hohen Salzburg. And the other was of a guy on a ledge trying to protect some women and children as bad guys pour over the ridge towards him. And he's, he's trying to fight them off and he can't do it. And at the very last second, an Apache comes up and mows them all down with a uh, cup with a Gatling gun. Uh, and so on September 1st, 2014, they were driving me crazy. And I just sat down and wrote the two scenes thinking, okay, I'll, I'll expunge them and I'll be done with it. Turns out they were connected and I didn't know it. I wound up writing about a 175,000 word novel, which was in 15 months, which was faster and longer than anything I'd ever written before. And it became the two books that are in the last brigade series. And the series is essentially about in the mid nineties in secret, the government developed cryogenics as people leave the military who have skills that we cannot easily replicate. Um, you may have been a 20 year artillery officer, or you may be a tanker. If you don't have a family to come home to, they recruit you to go into cryogenic sleep against the day you might be needed. Interesting. Because if we ever needed these people, you know, it's not like you can train a tanker overnight. So they go after, yeah, break, break glass in case of war. So sort of thing. Pretty much. Uh, the book follows the man that is specifically asked to be the leader. He's a patent type go-getter, three-star general, doing things that three-star generals don't actually do, but wouldn't it be cool if they did? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, he carries twin 50 caliber Desert Eagles. Yes. And, uh, and yes, he, do- it, maybe. he does get to use them, too. Uh, and so he gets recruited to go into this. His family has been killed in a terrorist attack. And uh, 50 years later, he wakes up when they're finally awakened by complete accident. The country has been gone for 50 years. They never got the wake up call and they have to now try and rebuild the country. In the meantime, the Chinese have overrun California. Um, There are warlords and bad guys and so, you know, things like that. And so that's pretty, that's pretty much what it's about. Um, I like the use of Chekhov's Desert Eagles. Oh yeah, yeah. What's what's that? What's the principle of Chekhov's gun? Yeah, good yeah, yeah. Good. And it, it's fun because uh, it, I got a little criticism on the first book because you know, three star generals don't go on tactical rescue missions and they don't use fifty caliber pistols, and you just kind of want to go, well, duh. And cryogenic I, I mean, isn't a thing either, right? Yeah, yeah although. Exactly. Although, shockingly, the Marines are actually testing battlefield cryogenics for severely wounded soldiers. Right. I mean, it's it's not a thing, but it's not science fiction completely yeah. anymore either. I mean, it makes I don't know where the technology is, but it makes sense that if you because you need to stop what's happening, so you can you know if you could stop the wound from progressing, which mean it could be kind of a you know slow everything way 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 down maybe you'd have a better chance of, of keeping people alive in those type of situations. And that's the, and that's the thing in cryogenics. Uh, I also found out that it's not the same thing as cryonics. Cryogenics is simply the study of matter at low temperatures. Okay. Whereas cryonics, now you're getting into, you die of cancer. They cut your head off against the day when a, they might be able to cure cancer. B, they might be able to bring you back to life. And then see, they might be able to attach your head to a new body. Although why would anybody want to? In case you wanted to be a centaur or something. I mean, that could be. (laughs) Wouldn't that be neat though? That now. Okay. See, this is how stories get written. Yeah. There you go. We're on the way. New anthology coming out. This this is great. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So I've got, I got to think about that. 
Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, you you laugh, but you don't know anything about Hit World yet. So uh, oh, this good. could this cool. could be a thing. Uh, I can't put it in the chat for some reason. Streamyard is not talking to YouTube right now. But James McCormick just said in the first chapter you give you place a desert eagle. Then in the last chapter you must shoot the bad guy, shoot through the bad guy and the bad guy behind him and the bad guy behind him, and then add da da da. Uh, yeah. Well, trust me, th those desert eagles are reloaded more than once. Yeah. The uh, they only hold. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just say if anybody's ever shot a Desert Eagle, and I'm, I, I guess because they're gas operated, but Desert Eagles are so much louder than a similar gun of the same caliber. Like you shoot a 357 Desert Eagle and you shoot a 357 Python, the Desert Eagle is like five times as loud. It's just deafening to hear one go off next year. They're crazy. One of the cool things I, I did learn when researching it on YouTube, though, is that there's a whole thing about, uh, it, it, I don't know how else to put it, but women in bathing suits skimpy bathing suits, shooting right. desert, shooting desert eagles. I can see and that being its own niche. That's definitely a thing. <laughs> it, it, it sure seems to be. And, uh, so, you know, not that I enjoyed that at all. No, no, well, no, it's no. For research it purposes, so you've got to do it for historical accuracy. I did. Like. And, and that's the only reason I did is how much recoil. And <laughs> Exactly. Patricia Gillum yeah. says, Stentor, a Stentor dude wakes up, quote, I did not fully read the terms and conditions. <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't that be crazy, though? Because, like, for him, it's like going to sleep and waking up. Like, no not time passes, right? So, like, you go to sleep, and you've got your body, and then you wake up, and you've got hooves and a tail, and you're like, what the hell just happened? Oh, oh, I've already got the story written. And <laughs> I've, already got, I've already got the title thanks to her. So okay. what, what is it? Terms and conditions. Oh, terms and conditions. See, some stories just write themselves. They, they do. do. I'm here first on Keystroke Media. Done. You were going to come on Keystroke Medium and have a title and a fully fleshed out story. I've got my dragon recorder, you know, voice oh. recorder. I'm ready to roll. We're twinsies. I've got mine. There we go. All right. Do you guys do, you uh, do voice dictation or is that just for notes and stuff? No, no. I, I'm trying voice dictation. Like to transcribe it into dragon or something. Yeah, I have dragon. My computer that I'm speaking with you now is so old that it Dragon doesn't work on it, but I have right. a new one I just haven't set up. It does work on my laptop. So I'm trying to learn it because I have arthritis really bad in my hands, and that limits me a lot. This finger right here, the left ring finger, uh, if I type too long, it just drops. It just does this. I don't know if you can tell, but it just stops working. Yeah. And I, I have, have to type with two fingers. I have to type in bursts. So I'll type like basically like a paragraph and then I'll shake my hand out and I'll think about it and I'll type again. And so I do a lot of dictation in all kinds of different ways. And it's probably a whole nother show, but, um, Kevin yeah. J Kevin J Anderson actually wrote a book about it and, uh, it's yeah, really read, good. Uh, the, uh, what is it called? Dictator something. I've read it. How, to, really be good. How to be a dictator. Be a dictator. Yeah. 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 And it is, it's really good. And so I'm, I'm tr I'm training myself, Scott, and and learning yeah. how to do it. Um, hopefully, I will okay. master it. No, yeah, I was going to say, hopefully, it's something I'll learn this year. Yeah, there's one a lot of things that I've learned out with the yeah. transcription is, um, like I'm I'm trying to like kind of ease into it, um, but doing like broad strokes and rec like just recording yourself talking through this the the chapter or the situation, and then just transcribing all of those notes. Uh, and you've got to take out some, but a lot of that, just the baseline of having that stuff out. And then, I mean, it's kind of like writing and then editing, right? You go back and you change what you really wanted to say and it, and you don't have to do the quotation marks or the punctuation or anything out. You just talk, uh, it backfires when I walk through Walmart and start saying hi to people because then the whole transcription is hi, no thanks. And I'm like, what am I talking about? Yeah, uh, I was, I tried it when I was driving one day and, uh, when I got home, it's like, you S, you know, you blankety blank. How <laughs> nice blinker, Jack Wagon. Yeah, oh. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I started actually, I do it a lot now because because my, my elbow and different things get, get sore from typing. Um, but I started doing it years ago as a mental exercise. Because like, you know, when you write it longhand and when you type, you kind of get a little bit different feel mm -hmm. of what you produce words wise. And so I started doing it as just a way to make myself think 
differently. Yep. And I kind of got kind of hooked on it. I do like it. And so a lot of times if I feel stuck, I'll voice dictate until I get unstuck. I yeah. like that. I like that. I hadn't thought about doing it that way, but yeah, that's pretty cool. Good tool. John Evans asked, do you transcribe uh, your own notes by hand, Josh, or do you use Dragon? I, I use uh, uh, Dragon uh, when I'm transcribing. When I, I record it and then plug it in, and it takes the audio file and gives me a Word document, and then I just edit it from there. Yeah, and Kevin, uh, Kevin, I thought that I just had while he's writing that is my I, I do a hot, lot of novel planning by hand uh on like legal pad and so it might be interesting to like just read those like i know you can get some scanning documents that'll scan it and turn it into text but just reading it off your hand notes and then transcribing that that might be a good process that's actually pretty solid that's that's that could be tight you should uh let's see hello unity 151 booktube welcome to the show james mccormick hello guy anthony demarco hello welcome everybody in the live chat sorry it's not coming through Streamyard. i can't uh i can't uh, post your guys's comments in the show today for some reason is not coming through but uh, welcome everybody uh, we're gonna take just a short break and do the show sponsor before we get into like diving into hit world and the idea behind that uh, so first I need to do this and I do that we had this uh, sponsor last week and it was really cool uh, to listen to her poetry it's the first collection uh, by Sarah Lipton's uh, CD Bay uh and Sidibe. Uh, Sidibe. Sidibe. yeah Sidibe. and uh, she is actually going to read one of her poems and uh so i'm gonna add that to here bam 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 and uh we'll listen to that here in a minute we'll be right back the nine Warm shoes, long hair and flares tank tops maxi skirts and bright shirts Slade, Sweet and T-Rex topped the charts, as well as the Carpenter's Mud and Gary Glitter. People didn't seem to have a care. But then there was the three-day week. Britain joined the EEC. Some felt this shouldn't be the path that the country followed. Decimalization changed the currency. Heath clashed with the miners and they went on strike. Bombs were exploding in Northern Ireland, and the USA was still in Vietnam, wanting her to become like Uncle Sam. Nixon was disgraced by Watergate, was replaced by Gerald Ford, and the Cold War was abated by detente. Love Story was on at the cinema, new faces made unknowns into stars, and Shaft was a TV hero. Muhammad Ali won many fights, and he talked on Parkinson about the nation of Islam. At the Munich Olympics, some Israelis were shot dead, but the games continued. Nevertheless, although the Israeli tragedy was publicized greatly by television news and the press. Arthur Ashe was the first black player to win Wimbledon in 1975. Ball dominated the game in the mid and late 70s, while Olga was the prodigy of gymnastics. Her performance was filled with so much drive. The beetle was in vogue, and so was the chopper bike. And then there was a craze for the skateboard, which some parents couldn't afford to buy their children. Punk blasted like a rocket onto the scene. Spiked hair and piercing became the fashion. And punks appeared on TV who didn't sing but screamed. Some felt that they were really obscene. There was the silver jubilee when many held street parties. But this time of glee was ended by the winter of discontent. And Thatcher and the decade of greed was on the horizon. This poem, the 1970s, is from my volume of poetry, The First Collection, which was published on the 1st of October 2020 by Jacaranda Books. The First Collection can be purchased from the Foils, Waterstones and Book Depository websites, as well as Amazon UK. And my name is Sarah Lipton City Bay, the author of the first collection. 
I just love the way that she reads that. It, it's so relaxing. Uh, uh, I'm not a huge poetry guy, but man, that that was a really cool uh, read. I would buy the audiobook if she read the phone book, if there were still phone books. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, very, very calming, very nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Let me stop that. And then, okay, so Hit World. Let's talk. Hit me with it. Uh, okay, so um, mid-1990s, back when I quit writing fiction, there was um, – uh, you guys are way too young for this probably, but AOL was the only place to be if you wanted to. I have an AOL account. I still have it. My email address yeah. is now 31 <laughs> years old. That's awesome. But uh, if you wanted to do what we're doing now, of course, there was no video, but it would be a chat room and a message board. That was AOL. Yep. There wasn't anywhere else. So I was on a board and uh, with a bunch of crime writers, and they are all now, I don't know if you guys read thrillers or crime novels, but one was Michael Connolly. Oh, God. Who, yeah. Yes. Harry, Bo Harry Bosch. Yeah. Um, Bosch. One, one was Max Allen Collins, who wrote Road to Perdition. Uh, Harlan Coben, another guy who's every Damn. book. Is, yeah. Uh, no kidding. <laughs> every now and then, Elmore Leonard dropped in. And honest to goodness, there were more authors than there were fans. And it was just, they would communicate, they just, to, you were just another person. This was before any of them were famous. Right. And more, and more Leonard was, but they, around, but yeah. Yeah. They were just getting started. And one of them was a guy named James W. Hall. And if you look up Jim's stuff, uh, his last book hit, hit number one on Amazon, the whole store, and stayed there for about three days. So he sells a lot of books and wow. uh, he wrote these little vignettes every uh, holiday about in a, in a Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett style, that noirish jargony thing about a PI named James Holiday, and down on his luck guy. And it was always funny and something bad happened to Holiday. Uh, the Easter bunny died on his doorstep or something like that. <laughs> I hate when that happens. Yeah. And, and so, you know, these were just for fun. It was just shared among the people there. And a couple of the other authors wrote a few. And uh, I started one and got about 500 words into it. And then AOL decided they no longer wanted to be relevant and shut down their message boards and wiped out the archives. So all those stories, uh, there were 35 that Jim had written. They all went away. But as it turned out, on the very last day, we didn't have a lot of notice of this, but on the last day, uh, I um, saved them all on a CD-ROM. And I discovered it in 2017. I sent it to Jim. I said, do you want these? He says, oh, man, I, I didn't even have them. Thank you. You know, and I sent them. And I sent him the one I'd written, and he encouraged me to finish it. So I did. That became a, a little short story, as I was telling you before the show, uh, called Kill Me, Kill me If You Can. Kill me when you can. And a friend of mine, Larry Hoy, read it and said, man, I've got an idea for this. Would you mind if I wrote a story in this universe? And that had always been the intention, to share this with some friends of mine who had some wild idea they wanted to put in, in a universe where assassination is legal. And Larry helped fill out the backstory and everything, so he's now the co-creator. So... What Hit World is, and then in early 2020, we decided, gee, maybe Chris, you know, uh, Chris Kennedy's kind of a sucker for this kind of stuff. So <laughs> he's a know, glutton for punishment. He is. He's, you know, we just, we asked him and he said, sure, let's do it. And at which case we both said, oh crap, now we've got to write actual <laughs> books. So we did. And uh, The Trash Man, which is the first book, uh, grew out of my story, Kill Me When You Can. The first 9,000 words or so are very much the same as they were in that little short story. And it starts out as a Dashiell Hammett kind of thing where um, I, I, I'm really proud of the first line. I'm not sure it makes sense, but it, it's a great, I think it's a great first line for that. And it's um, the, the blonde was bleached like raptor bones frozen in Cretaceous mud. Nice. And I was really proud of that. So um, as I was writing the book, it began to occur to me, and, and I guess you, the backstory for Hit World is that um, 
9-11 was so successful that it completely wiped out our government. The new president is a junior senator from Oregon with absolutely no authority, no respect. Nobody likes the guy. And he refuses to commit our military into what might become a world war to avenge it. So some mercenaries are funded by billionaires and they call themselves the life enders and they go get these guys. They execute Osama bin Laden live on TV and, you know, all the kind of things we should happen. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'd be down for that. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, you know, I'd have paid whatever they wanted for that. Oh, got down with terrorists. Hair, hair flowing everywhere here. So whatever. Uh, and, uh, so when they come home, now you've got all these mercenaries. They are the heroes, hero worship. And a lot of people left the military to go join them and things. So what do you do with them? Um, the people demand a revote. Uh, they don't like this president and, uh, they then have, uh, an election and the, the new president, I'm not going to name names, but, um, he, is going to die. They're going to take his gun away when, you know, they take it out of his cold dead fist. Right. And he's elected in a landslide and the Congress is what they decide to do is they decide to legalize murder. Interesting. Now it, it's a way to cut down on crime because if you actually kill somebody and you, you don't do it through the government, then anybody can kill you and take all your stuff. (laughs) So, all you have to do is prove they actually did it. I mean, and if you're in a, a gang, say, and you go out and you kill somebody, well, the rest of the gang members may go, you know, I really like his watch or whatever, his girl. And so they kill you and, uh, and there's no law against it. But if you're going to hire it done, the only legal way is you have to hire somebody who works for life enders. They got, and they got to be like credentialed or something. Kind of like John Wick when they put out the hit on him at the end in every sass in the world knows there's a hit on him. And that's what, uh, if you want my, uh, the elevator speech for the series is imagine John wick gets a license to kill and joins men in black. (laughs) I like that. So, um, that's what happens is you have to have a license. It all has to go through LEI. So the government gets their cut. It's not cheap. Now you can hire cheap assassins legally, but they're not necessarily very good. So they might miss and alert the guy. <laughs> Can you imagine being that shitty assassin? It's like he's like the uh, the really crappy private eye that really doesn't know what he's doing. And yeah, that would be that could be a good book in and of itself. Oh yeah, well, and, and there's three levels. There's LEI, but they have two subsidiaries. Uh, they have Murder Incorporated and uh, 187 Inc. Uh, and 187 is the, uh, the cheap guys, you know, they're all the trainees and <laughs> like showing up and, like, yeah, I'll take the job, but, um, you're going to have to loan me a gun. Cause I kind of don't <laughs> have one. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get the, the good stuff. Um, so anyway, and, uh, this guy's just living his life and he goes off uh, to kill this girl. And unfortunately, I, I mean, I don't want to give away too much, but he falls in love with the wrong woman. As never the happened. happened. Yeah, I, I can't imagine any man could ever relate to that, but never happened. Never happened. Never happened. <laughs> and uh, he finds out that the world is not at all what he thought it was. Um, it's not given away too much if you see the cover. There's a giant orange rhino uh, charging out of a tear in the sky. And that's called a Rakono. And a Rakono is an, uh, it looks like a rhino, but it's about the size of a locomotive. They're orange. Uh, they have very good vision and they're carnivorous. And and oh, a really bad combination to be like. <laughs> they're also they're also interdimensional. So oh. they happen to really enjoy Earth food, meaning us. <laughs> meaning two legs. <laughs> so they pretty much show up, eat, take off, and we can't follow. And. Uh, it's really about his discovery of what's out there. There is obviously a plot afoot that he has to help defeat. Um, it's a book where every idea I had for a story, but couldn't figure out how to tell as I was writing it, I thought, 
oh, what the hell? That fits perfect. You know, it makes no sense, but put it in. Put it in. Uh, there's a little segment with uh, Nemon, the man who repairs time, and because time is not active. Yeah, how do you get that job? I, you know. So yeah, you well, we're gonna have a story about it. He actually, I actually started a story for him many, many years ago, and I, I got about a thousand words into it, and I just kind of went, "Wow, I, I, I don't know. I couldn't get it done. It was so." bizarre and so complex i could not figure out my skills hadn't really gotten to that point yet either um, look really i see a question because i can see the comments and yeah i was waiting for you to um segue into it uh how do you balance the world building versus the plot this book was actually easier than it might sound because this book is based on a one of my favorite all-time books and a book that actually has quite a bit of influence on my writing style. That's Nine Princes in Amber by John by Roger Zelazny. If you have not read that book, um, it's you can read the first 40 pages and still not know what genre it is. You're going to think it's probably a noir book, but it's not. And it has... It, it, People, somebody who has read uh, an advanced copy of The Trash Man, and by the way, I'm sorry you didn't get an ARC. Talk to Chris. Uh, shake him down later. There you go. I'll do like some collective fist shaking in the air. But um, he, the structure of my book is based on that book. The narrative drive, it's, it's rearranged in a few places, but... Th- People that have read it have said, I don't see that. And then when I would tell them where my book was similar to his, then they would say, oh, okay, I see that. But it's not like it's a direct copy or anything along those lines. It's just I took that narrative drive and said, okay, there has to be a journey here. There has to be a a, a discovery here. There has to be, uh, you know, something um, here. And went on like that. And the very last sentence is an homage to the very last sentence of Nine Princes in Amber. And so that that's how I managed to um, keep the to balance plot versus uh, what's going on, narrative drive, keep it going, and all that. Um, because it seems like there's a lot of fresh world building that's going into this, but then you're also, I mean, it's, 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 it seems like it's near future. So a lot of it is, is, um, there already. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you mentioned that you're just, you're taking bits and pieces from these other ideas and kind of jamming it all together. Um, it, it, was there any, a point in, in the brainstorming of that? You say you're a pantser ever a point where you were like, there's so much here. I don't know if this is going to work. Oh, and, and then how do you, how did you manage to put it all together and pull out the pieces that didn't work? How, how did all that work? Um, yes, I, I'm very much like so many writers in that, uh, I'm sure we've all seen animal house with the devil and the, uh, angel, you know, mm-hmm. do it, do it, do it. You know, no, don't. And so uh, I have, um, the uh, imposter sitting on one shoulder mm-hmm. a- and saying, you know, this is crap. This is crap. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm sure every writer does. We, we all, we know that newer writers think it's terrible and that stops them. And we've probably learned to push through that and realize it's probably a little better than you're giving yourself credit for. Usually. Um, yeah. With me, it's, there's always a certain phase in the process where it hits me the strongest. You know, and it's some of that's fatigue, I think. But then, then you come back and look at it later. So, and, and you read it later, and you say, "Yes, yeah, is better than I remembered it being." Yeah, uh, usually. Uh, yeah. So or, yeah, yeah, yes. Just to answer the question, Josh, um, there was a point at which I was very much wondering, "Did I pull this all together? Does it hang together?" Uh, I asked the editor. You guys know Maya. Yeah, she's watching on Facebook right now. Okay, hi Maya. And she can, she can verify that one of the first things I, I would do is when I knew she was actually editing it, I would go, okay, okay. How far have you gotten? How far have you gotten? You know, is it any good? Is it hanging together? 
And uh, so, yes, that was there all the way through. And when I went back and read it for myself, once I was done, then I realized that it, it did. I had done what I hoped to do and all of that. You always wonder, should I've had a little bit more uh, backstory here? Should I've, does it drag here and there? And, um, but I think I pretty much nailed what I was hoping to say with it. And um, let's see. Oh, she says, uh, hi, that's her. Uh, that's Maya. And uh, yes, he uh, yes, he did. That that comment didn't come through yet. I see it over here. I'm like okay. multitasking between I've got YouTube comments here and Facebook comments over there. And some of them come through and some of them don't. So I pair from that. Yeah. Um, so it this is the first book and you, you just started the second book. But you also mentioned before we started that there's what nine other people that are going to be writing in this there's universe. Actually, probably more than that currently. Okay. There, but but one of them's an anthology. So here's what we've got: the okay. next book, the next book coming is co-written by me, and it's. Remember, I told you there were those two novellas to start. Yeah. Well, this is the beginning. This is from that second novella, which I also co-wrote. Okay. And it's called "A Bullet for the Shooter," and it's about what happens when somebody wants to be a, a, a hitman. They want to be a shooter and that's what they're called as shooters. They want to be a shooter. They're going out for their qualifying kill. And then they realize this guy hasn't done anything to me. Yeah. I can't and, do it. I, I, you know, what do I do? Yeah. And, and, but he gets mixed up in something that he didn't see coming. Uh, Larry Hoy was the primary writer on this. And then I went back and added some things. Uh, it does have ghosts which is a lot of fun because they're not ghosts as you typically see them. Uh, one of them had quit smoking in life and then takes it back up when he's dead because, you know, why not? Yeah. Uh, can't die twice. And, uh, he gets mad when, uh, you know, his lungs are out away and he can't smoke anymore. Um, so that's the second book. The third book is written by John Sears. John is a veteran science fiction writer and it's, it's a different, set called the fairy man um the fourth book is is called shank it's written by robert krogh and this all happened the the weird part about all this is it happened organically mm -hmm. i didn't i didn't go out and say would you like to write these books i put the the concept out there and uh these are all my friends i, I know these guys and we had told them originally that would you like to write in hit world back when it was chris didn't have it they're all veteran writers. They all know how to tell a great story. And they just started writing them. And the anthology got going when uh, someone who's uh, writing in one of my other universes, John Babb, sent a story, a Hit World story in that we didn't even know he was writing. <laughs> nice. And it's a short story. And he, and he turned it in. And uh, then uh, David Blaylock, and David's been around for 40 years. You guys may have run into him at a convention somewhere and David Blaylock turned one in and we're kind of going, Oh, I guess we've got a, I guess we've got a, an anthology. <laughs> so, um, we're going to see, it's not filled out yet. If anybody wants to write a story, uh, you know, talk to Chris, but, um, I love that. Let's, let's put, a, uh, everybody in the chat, send Chris a message just right now. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, and so, uh, Chris, Chris now has authority, you know, he has final say on who can do what and things like that. But, uh, as it turns out, I think there's nine stories that are either in development or being actively written. John Sears is about done with his second book. Larry's about done with his follow-up to a bullet for the shooter, which is a standalone, uh, that he's writing without me. Um, uh, I have started the second book in mine, so we're going to see it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And How I hope you're handling the the shared aspect, like like for Four Horsemen, there's a, a a world bible, and you've got all the alien races and all this different thing. Are you guys doing the same thing for this universe, or are you just yeah. letting, are you letting the authors kind of develop their own canon? How does that work? Both. Uh, okay. there, there is a bible. I don't want to tell people yet. I'm letting them create canon to a point, hmm. as long as it stays within the structure of what we've already put together. 
Uh, right. Very much like like the Four Horsemen. You can create a lot of stuff as long as it doesn't conflict with what's already been done. Yeah. And so that's kind of where we are with this. There are certain things, the magic system, because there is magic. And the only thing that so far we're not going to allow is interplanetary travel. Okay. Um, there are uh, aliens. And I'm, uh, I have one free story up on uh, the factory floor, which is Chris's, you guys know, uh, Chris's site for sharing things in his publishing mm -hmm. world, CKP, the factory floor. And then I'm putting another one up to, to borrow uh, involving the same characters. It's a little bit longer as a forerunner to the launch on Friday of the novel. Oh, right on. And so, uh, but other than that, I, I'm pretty much letting people do what they want. Um, the magic system is such that, and, and it, I'm not really giving them anything away to tell you that magic is not magic. It is a, a naturally occurring energy field that every one of us has some ability to affect, but there's a scale to, that measures how well you're able to do that. For example, um, our, some of us seem to have some bit of precognition some more than others. <clears throat> and in hit world, you may have, uh, the ability to sense danger, uh, a la spotty sense, if you will. Yeah. Some people may have it very strongly. Some may not. One of my characters knows how to shoot a gun and he almost never misses because he is unconsciously directing whatever it is he's shooting, throwing, or anything else to its target using this energy force. Oh, right on. And so it's it's very much it's like what what why is one quarterback better than the other? Well, his he ha scores higher on the scale, and the best on the scale is forty two because I'm a Douglas Adams fan. <laughs> yes, forty two. Um, and so. These guys all all have this ability and it's all measured, but nobody really knows this. This is not something if you tried to tell something, it would be like trying to convince somebody who doesn't believe in Bigfoot that Bigfoot exists. Right. Or that magic exists in real life. There are people who do think they can, uh, uh, their religions based on the fact that you can, you can um, put a curse on somebody. Yeah. You, and, and things. So it's the same thing. They firmly believe it, but if you don't believe it, then you, it's not real to you. Well, in hit world, it's exactly the same way, but everything is actually real. And that's the tagline is everything you don't believe is real. So we're, we're letting people develop what they will, as long as it's within the framework of how LEI life enters is set up, how the government has things set up, the rules and regulations pertaining to it, all that kind of thing. Um, a magic user is called a Gatandi. G A T A. In DI. And that's um, a derivation of a Hmong word. Uh, the people over in Vietnam. Okay. Right? So the Hill Tribe. Uh, and it meaning magic user. <clears throat> so as long as you stay within that, you can do whatever you want. And you say that. So the first book comes out this Friday. This Friday, The Trash Man. And, and the, 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 just so you know, the trash man refers to there's a, a segment of LEI in Hit World that most people don't know exists. And if you told them it exists, they don't believe it. And that very core elite call themselves the trash men because they clean up the trash that nobody else can. Gotcha. Uh, so, the way you mentioned it, it seems like you're going to release a book and then somebody else is going to release a book and it kind of kind of goes on down the line there. Um, and they're going to be all kind of connected. Um, yes. Do you see, do you know what the second book is going to, when the second book is going to be out? Or are you doing like a 30 day rapid kind of release uh, it, schedule? About, about every five weeks. Five. Weeks. Uh, I think Chris first said the release date for the second book was the 22nd, but I think it's now the 26th of February. Gotcha. And so that would put uh, the third book, uh, which I believe Maya's editing now. Um, so far, Maya is, I don't know if she's technically the series editor, but I, she's been editing the books. Right. Uh, 
so far uh, to keep that continuity. And um, that one probably is going to be in late March, early April. Very cool. Excellent. Oop. Yeah, it's it's very exciting for me because uh, some of this some of this story goes back into the 1970s. Things I was thinking of that has finally come to uh, come to print, and so it's really you guys know when you've been thinking about something and you've been planning something, you always wanted to get it out there, but you, you couldn't figure out how to do it, and then you do. Yeah. Well, it and, sits there. And, it's, it just uh, it sits there and. Uh, ferments in your imagination for who knows how long. And then it comes out and it's just strange and wonderful when it finally sees the light of day. And, and, and in this book, I really surprised myself in a lot of ways in my storytelling ability to get it done. Uh, it, it was all stuff <laughs> that I would have in it. I'm sorry. Just because of how much was in it. Well, what I mean is there's, there's a lot of different, elements in it that are very, very big. Mm. And how do you describe driving a truck, an armored, actually an armored personnel carrier, uh, through the space con time continuum? <laughs> right. And so it took me, uh, I've had that in my mind for a long time, but how do you do it? And how do you deal with the relative distances and all those different weird factors. Uh, why is there air, you know, on this road that's in the middle of no, nothing, but yet if you get off the road, there's no air. Uh, and so at some point you, you, when you're trying to do that stuff and you're not very good at it yet, you start over explaining things. Yes. Now, you see that a lot in, um, where it, you could, you just could have said they're breathing on that road. And and because the readers already suspended their disbelief already, that's just one more thing that they're like, okay, check mark, that makes sense. But then if you spend two paragraphs explaining the physics behind why they can, then you're like, a, I really don't care about that, and b, well, now you've ruined it because now I'm thinking about it. Yeah, you've pulled them out of that emotional connection to the story and put them into the logical side of their brain. Right. And then and, you're locked in that forever. Yeah, exactly. And and. That's kind of the way I was doing it. Um, I think the way I explained it was some guy actually fell off and was shocked that he couldn't breathe. Yeah. This, oh, this is awkward. <laughs> yeah. This is bad. Uh, so I think in that respect that it probably could not have been written any sooner than it really was in that. I don't think I was the, a storyteller good enough to do it. Um, just this morning. And it's, uh, and you guys, Again, I'm, I'm, I know I'm speaking to fellow writers and you guys know all this the same way I do, as do many of the people listening. But you mind your old stuff that you never published, the stories that you didn't finish or you finished, but you just kind of went, ah. Right. I distracted something else, something, you know, there's lots of different reasons to get pulled off of a project. You know, exactly. I had, and, and, and this is why uh, I have had a literary agent a big name literary agent. I will never have another literary agent because back, and this was in the eighties, but I had a project that she pitched for me and um, she didn't do science fiction. She didn't tell me that. Yeah. Nice. So she's talking to the best thing that ever came out of it was I got a handwritten at a boy, try us again. I liked this. It's just not quite there from, um, Lester Del Rey's wife, Judy Lynn Del Rey. And she was an icon. I mean, she and Lester were the driving force behind Del Rey books. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, that was great. But I also sent her a story uh, about a, an assassin. I guess I have, you know, murder like on my mind. Trend. Yeah. Right. I know. Uh, who is uh, British. Right. And it's told from his standpoint and he uh, is assisted in his efforts by the ghost of Winston Churchill. And it came across very much as um, one of my favorite authors is P.G. Woodhouse. If you guys have never read him or seen the show um, Jeeves and Wooster. Didn't ring a bell. Uh, 
And the name sounds familiar, though. Absolutely drop dead hilarious. Jeeves and Wooster was on PBS for a long time. Um, and Peachy Woodhouse was an absolute genius of a British comedian. And, and is pretty much acknowledged as a genius of that. Uh, Hugh Laurie, who went on to play House, played uh, Wooster. And Bertie Wooster is this clueless, rich Englishman in this universe that's 1920s England, 1930s, and just never changes. Uh, it's timeless. It, and he's he's well-meaning. He's a great guy. Jeeves is his manservant who knows everything there is to know. And... Uh, but anyway, so I'd written this book in that style, and she came along and said, yeah, nobody wants to read this. You know, uh, It's like the same guy who told me nobody wanted to read about a World War II you know, thriller because World War II is over with. Right. Uh, get that. Well, he's an idiot. But uh, <laughs> yeah, never mind. There's been like hundreds of books and movies that are extremely popular you know, in the last 70 this- years or whatever. This was in the 80s, and uh, he actually dangled a contract in front of me for a book with a, how much advance we'll give you. But I want you to rewrite it. It was 70,000 words. He said, I'd like it to be about 120. Jeez. And this was in the days before word processors. So I spent two years rewriting the whole thing on a typewriter and, and then uh, went to his office when it was finally finished and said, here. And he goes, oh, man, uh, this is awesome. I'm sure I'm going to love it, but we're not doing fiction anymore. And, of course, I you know, I was not armed at the time, which That's is probably a good thing. <laughs> because, so, how hard is it to pick up the phone? Hey, Bill, you know, if you're still rewriting that thing, don't, don't, you know, we're not doing fiction. Or, or better yet, yeah, we're but I could know some people who are still doing fiction. Maybe I could give you a referral to somebody this would work perfect for. No, nah, he's, I don't think he's, I don't think anybody, he knew anybody. I, I, or if he did, I don't think anybody wanted to know him and admit it. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, go ahead. The, your book is called, tell me the name again. I'm drawing a blank. The Trash Man. The Trash Man. Uh, it comes out on Friday. Yes, it does. Um, people can find it on Amazon now. Is it, is it up for pre order? Nope. Chris doesn't do pre-orders. Okay. Which I agree with. Yep. Uh, it will be up Friday and we will see what happens then. Uh, it, it, I'm sure like all other Chris K- Kennedy books, it will be KU. Yeah. And, um, if, if you're going to read Chris Kennedy's output, you probably need KU. Yeah. You know. you, you, unless you're independently wealthy, you want to buy five books a day or whatever. <laughs> yeah. He, 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 he put out 66 books last year. Whew. A lot of books. Yeah, and they're not short. Either. We're we are kind of a, a little bit over, and uh, we need to kind of uh, wrap up a little bit. Uh, but I do want to tell uh, all of our live viewers and then anybody that's listening on the stream later, uh, you can find out more about William Allen Webb's website, thelastbrigade.com, uh, and actually front and center there, you can see uh, the cover for the Trash Man. And uh, head there, give him some support and uh check out the book when it comes out uh bill thank you so much for coming on the show man it's been a blast hanging out with you it, it's so, it's been an honor to be with you guys it really has so many stories. i love it good times yep uh everybody in the live chat thank you guys for hanging out with us man guy anthony demarco's in the chat welcome welcome uh james mccormick uh james evans james evans actually knew what you were talking about with the <laughs> jeeves and wooster so that's cool we're from the other side of the pond uh silent wolf hello and everybody else thank you guys for hanging out with us on this monday morning if you haven't got your coffee yet go get it keystrokemedium.com click on the little red coffee icon that's where i'm headed you can get whole bean now tyler davis was asking me about that the other day because he's doing some i don't know newfangled oh hey lou's in the chat what's up lou I want to get some. I'm going to grind me some coffee beans. That's right. Uh, go and pick it up. Next week, we have uh, Rhett C. Bruno that's going to be on the show. We're going to talk about his uh, new novel, The Roach, um, that is already winning awards and narrated by the one and only R.C. Bray. Uh, you're not going to want to miss that show. And then we have shows scheduled all the way out to March. So it's going to be a really busy beginning of the year. Uh, Chris is actually coming back on the show, barring any. Um, Chris Kennedy is when, when is he coming? When is he is coming? coming for the, the book with David Weber by any chance? Uh, well, he is coming on the eighth. 
but I'm tr- well, I, I, that's just him. Uh, and we're trying to get, uh, trying to work out schedules for him and David Weber too. Uh, of course, when we schedule David, we have to make sure that we have like a three hour window, uh, because he likes to chat. Uh, everybody, thank you guys for coming and hanging out. We're going to be back next week. We're going to talk about some reading. We're going to talk about some writing and of course, everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium. Have a good Monday.